So I'm going to talk, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I think Tessa's um, made a really, put together a really good program here where the, hopefully the three will kind of segue quite well. Um, and uh, I've got up here a picture. I'm wondering if people have worked out what this picture is. Um, I was having this conversation with Tessa. Um, I mean, it looks a little bit abstract, perhaps, and you can you could kind of like put 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 a number of categories on it or associations. It's actually a um, a little jetty um, on just coming off the coast of Aberystwyth, which is where I live, which is in West Wales. Beautiful town. You're all very welcome. Um, and uh, it's this beautiful jetty. And uh, but I think the picture is a bit like, well, what's that? You know, what what is that? And what's it doing? And um, really invites you with, with and, and it's representative perhaps of the, the work that I've been doing, is how do we look at a problem differently? How do we look at the same thing and possibly see something a little bit difficult? I mean, diff difficult, maybe difficult too. <laughs> how can maybe see something different? Um, and it's also a wonderful place because the kids just... Um, so another reason it's up there is because it's my home. Wales is my home now, and the kids jump off that jetty in the summer, and, and it's a really iconic piece of the town. Let's see if this... Oh, yeah, it does. So what I'm going to do for you today in 30 minutes, I'll keep an eye on the time, and do kind of give me a nod, is that um, I'm going to go three things. I'm going to give you a little bit of context. So I've been, as Tessa said, I've been working on this programme with senior civil servants in Wales, and that's been with... Um, directors working on the NHS and the Treasury, um, working on poverty, tackling poverty in Wales. And, um, but before I kind of jump into that, I'm going to give you a bit of context, my context, because I think this is a really important um, for the work and for you to understand the work a bit. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the problem of governance, what problems do we have in governance at the moment, and that's also going to include a little bit around um, theory um, and theories that I've used in the program. And then I'm going to talk about the program and give you um, some of the quotes, particularly just a few quotes from some of the um, participants in that course. So all of us have a context, and I think it's really important as a researcher and a mindfulness practitioner and trainer to kind of know your context and to state your context um, because it often we're coming to this work i mean all our work is personal it's personal and so where we come from informs what we do maybe speaking to what joe was saying as well so this is me i live in wales i like road biking as you can see actually when i was young i lived in croydon i lived in um, quite a working class area i would define my kind of place of origin like a working class family uh, and I cycled around Croydon, so it's quite a thing for me that now I moved from the streets of Croydon to the hills of Wales. I speak Welsh as well, which is apparently unusual for people from Croydon, I don't know. Um, I have a practice, my practice, so obviously the practice that I have done um, informs my work. And I started off with a Gwenka course, I actually started off doing yoga, and then uh, I actually trained as a yoga teacher. So, and I trained, I taught yoga for 15 years alongside my main job in Wales. And um, I did the Passioner course and then the kind of standard 10 day retreats for a few years. I've also um, done the mindfulness training course as well. So I've got a practice that has a Buddhist context as well as the secular mindfulness context, as well as the yoga context, which does inform my way of working and how I see the world. It was a British wheel of yoga training. I have children. This is my son. Um, my, I have a daughter as well, and I'm very sorry to her that she, her picture's not up here as well. Um, but the reason I put this one up is because um, he grew up in a co-housing project in Wales. So that's part of my context as well. I've lived and worked, kind of explored after coming from where I came from. Uh, interesting to explore different models, different ways of living and working. Um, that kind of divided resources up in different ways. And uh, so he's a product of that. And uh, so far, he's doing pretty well. I've worked on social and environmental change most of my life. I started work after being a journalist for a short time. I worked um, for Shelter, and I've worked um, as VSO. 
Um, and I, the picture here is with Rhonda McGee, who currently is really um, doing excellent work around colour insight and mindfulness. Uh, so I'm kind of positioning myself there as somebody who works on uh, these issues, has an interest in these issues. Um, I ran a social enterprise in Wales working on environmental issues, my last job. But now I'm a researcher, which is kind of strange for me. Well, no, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful opportunity. And here I am at the Amsterdam conference um, which happened earlier this year, which is one of the big mindfulness research conferences. And we had a little with some people actually that are here today and um, some wonderful people here, uh, Christina and David Forbes and Nick, all kind of working on different aspects of mindfulness and how it can make a difference in the world. So that's wonderful. So all of that informs everything you're going to see. And I'm going to add another thing, which is a bit vulnerable for me, I have to say. I could even feel it now. So I'll just name that. It's another key thing that informs, that I need to tell you, informs the work and my approach, is that I have a high adverse childhood experience score. And some of you might know about the ACE score. If you don't, you might want to go and have a look, because um, it's a list of questions that you fill in. Um, and it looks at things like whether you experience divorce, um, whether you experienced emotional or physical abuse. And uh, if you've got a score on this over four, then it means that um, the statistics are kind of against you in terms of what might happen next in your life. Um, so, I mean, these are a few graphs. If you've got a high A score, then uh, you're more likely to have early teen sexual experiences. You're more likely to have underlying chronic depression, um, more likely to be raped as you grow up. It's, yeah, it's not very cheery, I have to say. Um, more likely um, to ha have a suicide attempt and kind of fits with everything else, really. More likely to um, be prescribed with antidepressants. Now, probably the reason I'm standing in front of you now is because I've got a high level of resilience, which I got from my, from my family who were very resilient, um, but there's also a lot of trauma there as well. And if you're going to look at this, you need to look at the two together. You know, resilience and A scores go together. So why am I bringing, why is it important to me to bring this up? Because when we're thinking about mindfulness or, and what we're using this for, sometimes we think quite rightly, well, how can we help the individual? You know, how can we do something that is going to give deal with the suffering, deal with the individual. Quite, and, and a lot of the work has been around that. A lot of the work has been around that. And, um, and that's brilliant. And I myself have benefited. My practice certainly helped me um, work with trauma. And then it's kind of moved forward again, one step forward. Well, OK, that's good. But how do we actually look more widely about how... Um, how people are impacted, you know, why, well, let me say there's two things here. One is like why people end up having adverse childhood experiences and can we do anything about that, number one. And number two, can we look at the wider issues of um, adverse childhood experiences and then what that leads to? Because, you know, people in prison, most people in prison, I, some great work by a guy called Gabor Mate I was listening to this week. I'd recommend him to anybody interested. I see a few nods, you know, who really is very interested. It's like, well, if you look at most people in prison, you know, a lot of them have had adverse childhood experiences. They've got high levels of adverse childhood experiences. So we've really got to look at that wider social implications of... Um, adverse childhood experience, which is not just about giving them mindfulness or giving them mindfulness in the context, in that, in that wider context. So I hear some of you, see some of you nodding, and I'm, yeah, you hear that, that's great. And the other thing that we need to do is, um, is consider new ways of working. And this is a, a quote from uh, John Kabat-Zinn, as you can see in a conversation with Angela Davis in East Bay Meditation Centre. And she was saying, well, yeah, she'd actually been in prison. She's an activist. Some of you might know her. She'd been in prison. And uh, she said, it's great. I th I'm kind of loosely remembering what she said. She said, you know, it's great doing mindfulness in prisons, John, but does it really address the wider kind of social issues? You know, and how can we actually do that? 
How can we address those issues? And he said, well, we need to develop new models. We need to incubate these new models. You know, are there strategic and tactical ways that we can find to develop different orthogonal, orthogonal he uses that word a lot, John Cabinson, orthogonal models that work better? So that's kind of the invitation to us while we're looking at this wider debate is we need to be we need to be developing being creative making mistakes testing models so the work which uh, i've been doing has been trying to address this trying to kind of find new ways of working look at problems differently looking at new ways of working okay and that's uh, mainly through Aberystwyth university so we're a bit out on the edge as well so this work may be a little bit out on the edge and uh, and also the University of Birmingham. I'm now actually writing up a PhD, um, which will incorporate most of the work that you're hearing now. Some of this work is, is slightly older. Looks a bit dull as well, I have to say. I'm looking for something that might look a bit more, yeah, funky in the next stage. Okay, so when I started the research, and even today, when, when we start to ask this question, and some of this has come up already, how can mindfulness address these wider issues. We all care and we want this to do a little bit more maybe than it's doing. So I'm just going to quickly this just quickly show you that this this area is huge because as some people I said, I think Jamie said it already. We could just we need to make it more accessible. You know, that's that's really important that we make this work as it is more accessible. And I'm using MBSR MBCT as a, a kind of shortcut for secular mindfulness. We need to make sure that trainers actually represent a wider demographic, not just delivering it to a wider demographic, but actually representing, which the two are obviously linked, um, a wider demographic. We, I've worked in sustainability education for a long time. We need to really consider the frames that we use in any training. Are they the best frames? You know, are they using examples that would support our environmental change? I mean, people might think this is a small point, but actually the frames you hear all the time really tell you, you know, really informing you about your world. So uh, I've got my MBSR training book, and I think there is one about taking the rubbish out in my book anyway, I don't know if it's changed, but yeah, we need to change that. That needs to say, take it, sorting my recycling. We need to reinforce these positive frames all the time. Do we just look at mindfulness? Do we, there's lots of papers which is attempt to prove that mindfulness does make people pro-social, that that's how it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure that the evidence is, is, is as strong as we would like in the way that we would like it. Do we need to revitalize it in terms of its, you know, Buddhist, ethics um has it lost its ethical roots that's another way people look at it do we need to emphasize the compassion now the compassion um is is a topic i hear about a lot there was um, someone over here talking to me about it just now um i mean great intention um yeah and i think we need to really look at that is that what we need to do maybe we need to deliver an advanced or second tier mindfulness after someone's done MBSR maybe they can do another course on top of that that looks at wider issues well that's great too isn't it because it kind of expands the thinking maybe we should develop MBSR for people who are creating change activists or just people working in organizations trying to um, develop corporate corporate um, social responsibility anybody who's out there and trying to make a difference maybe we could do, do, do things um, to help them with mindfulness uh, maybe we could develop MBSR for people responsible for policy and change. And we've already heard Dan and Jamie discuss one way that we might do that. And this is, this is just a few. I have three slides with things we could be doing that like around this, in this area. And some of it look quite small, some of it look quite big, some of it conflicts with each other. You know, some people think we should be doing something, but there's lots that can be done in this area. And there's a huge amount of research that can be done in this area. Meanwhile, and this is the thing that kind of blows my mind a little bit as well, a lot of the, the um, research, you know, on mind, on emotion, on things that inform um, our programs, well, there's huge amounts of interesting things happening in those areas as well. So actually, we know we don't actually agree on what, we're not, we don't actually not agree, but there are, many different defini definitions of mindfulness. There is no agreement on what mindfulness is. There actually is no particular agreement on what mind is, or perception, or cognition. 
um, which actually came as a bit of a surprise to me as well as to how much debate there are in, this air, in, in these areas. As for emotion, I got a book out the other day with all about 100 papers on, you know, what is emotion? And realize, and well, I've done lots of reading before that because I included it in my course, but there's not really much agreement on what emotion is. In fact, there's a lot of disagreement on what emotion is. Emotion regulation, similarly, the function of the default mode network that a lot of us kind of take for granted in our training, actually, there's, uh, people contest that, what, what, what it's actually there for and whether it's more social or uh, self-referential. The amygdala, there's, um, people don't all agree on what the amygdala does. Uh, and the big thing really is, well, you know, you have these pictures in neuroimaging and like, who's actually putting the theories onto these pictures? They're pictures, you know, and there's a lot of kind of very interesting discussion about that out there about, um, you know, who's making, who's doing what relative to these images, who's saying what. Okay, so that's, the context. Okay, so with all that in mind, my particular context has been, has moved from could, uh, just looking into whether mindfulness creates more pro-social or pro-environmental behaviours, to like, okay, well actually what could, what could we do here? And I work in Wales, um, Wales is a great country and it's quite a small country and it's also one of the few countries that's actually put legislation in um, which requires the public sector to be more sustainable. It has a, something called the Future Generations and Wellbeing Act. Um, and so, and that includes changing ways of working, them changing ways of working. So they've really appreciated that they need to change ways of working in order to get a paradigm shift in, uh, in sustainability and wellbeing. So my context has been there and, um, the thing is, what you quickly realise, and I did work in the public sector for many years, so I kind of had a sense of this, is the world has changed since the civil service, since policy makers kind of, policy making was designed. You know, policy making was designed to regulate and count things. You know, just tell people what to do and to, to count numbers. But the world has become really complicated. You know, we've got five, as already been mentioned, you know, we've got these wicked problems. You do something over here and something goes wrong over here. There's multiple stakeholders. It's really complicated out there. Meanwhile, um, the job has become much more relational. It's still quite a hierarchical system, as we know, but um, it's become much more a job of relating. Um, 90, you know, 70 to 90% of their jobs are talking to each other. This is funny. Oh, let's see if this works, shall we? Um, did this weird... Six weeks. Especially. Right, yeah. Okay, kind of flips. It's weird. Right, so just, just have a little look. This is a little, um, this is a little snippet from uh, a meeting in Keridigion, where I live, uh, a health board having a meeting. So just consider this for a second. Oh, no. In six weeks, especially the broad life is strategically placed for us going forward, I'd just like some children to please. Okay, so they're having a meeting. This is a board meeting, it's really important. Now, just I see if we can pause it there. Um, Bronglice Hospital, they've had to close out, they, they, they're wondering about beds, they haven't got enough beds, and there's an emergency. Um, an A&E department, I think, just closed down and they're having a conversation. Um, now, does this look to you like a good way to have a conversation? <laughs> you know, to have a conversation about something that's really important, where you need the people to be like really relaxed and to really be able to talk properly to each other and maybe come up with some creative solutions. And you could maybe see, you know, they're hunched behind their computers. There's this strange row of seats opposite them that are empty. Um, you look at that, just look at them. They're slightly stressed. We know that this is not a, um, a good way to operate. So why, why do we still do it? Is, so we might say what actually happens is because these situations are so stressful, you know, people end up on the other end of them kind of having small breakdowns. And then maybe we give them MBSR to kind of wipe them up and put them back in. 
that's probably a little bit, but you know, <laughs> I do feel quite strongly about it because really what I want to do is stop having meetings like this that make people stressed. Would seem a much, much better thing to do. And meanwhile, very relevant to this is, yeah, uh, just a couple of points. Um, I, I mean, I, I, there's a whole bit of theory that I kind of, is the basis for the program that I'm doing. Um, you know, theory on emotion and cognition is changing very fast. And um, it's gone beyond emotional intelligence. This idea that emotion and cognition interact so strongly that a demarcation between them um, turns out to be a fruitless exercise. In the end, we must talk of an emotion-cognition amalgam. And so it's not about heart and head. It's about heart-head. And I know there's, you know, that that will come into the mindfulness too. But mood and thinking are completely interrelated. And so that is really important for the people who are making our policy to understand. Really important. Um, here's a picture of Angela Merkel with, with yeah, Putin. And it's quite a famous picture because he allowed his dog to come in knowing that she um, had a bad, very bad experience with dogs when she was younger. So he knew that it would stress her out. And you can see she looks slightly nervous. And for me, this is, you know, a lot of um, our politicians, a lot of people um, who are making policy, they've got emotions. And these are really in effect how they are interacting and how they are doing the work we need them to do. So it's really important that they understand all this, that they really understand emotion and cognition, and we use the best science that we can to help them. Meanwhile, there's a whole lot of work around bias, and we understand what we understand the mind to be, that we understand the mind to actually be more predictive than reactive. There was some discussion about um, us being less reactive and of course mindfulness you know puts that pause in and that's great but actually there's some science out there that actually probably fits better in terms of for me anyway and, and i've heard others say so too in terms of how the mind operates it's much more predictive and that it will actually create bias and this um this is problematic for um, basic decisions that we make that will tend to look for information that confirms what we already know rather than seeing new information and it also has an effect on unconscious bias because um you know we will um prejudice will come from that relative to you know all sectors gender race sexuality um and and so that's all in there so that's a really important shift in how science in, is starting to look at the mind, which could really inform how we deliver mindfulness. Okay. I'm a bit, am I all right with time? Okay. So, on the basis of all that, for the last seven years, actually, I've been working in Welsh Government. Um, in some relation to this, um, to this act, um, I'm now ending up uh, with a PhD piece of work, I did an MPhil on it and I've worked as a research associate on it, um, but finally doing a, a PhD, um, which was with the SCS, the Senior Civil Service. This is Cate's, probably hardly any of you have heard. This is where, this is in Wales, the Welsh Civil Service, a lot of them are. Um, we have people who work opposite to this building as well. <laughs> um, Cardiff University is just around it. So this, we call it mindfulness-based behavioural insights and decision-making uh, because they were able to kind of take that. You know, it's not mindfulness for stress management. So they were, if I called it mindfulness for stress management, then a lot of people wouldn't have come on it. The managers wouldn't come on it that I was working with. And also, it's not so much what they were interested in. We had senior civil servants on it. Um, the head of treasury actually was a champion for the programme I did for the PhD. Um, Deputy Director of the NHS, people working on tackling poverty in um, really poor areas in Wales, childcare, you can see their education. So really working on a wide um, areas. Eight sessions over three months, possibly unusually for um, a mindfulness course actually starting with a day session. Very interactive. So that's another way we can talk about mindfulness being more social is actually by making it more social in the learning. Um, and I used some of these novel theories. I was using behavioural economics, theories of bias, predictive mind, constructed emotion. And I was supported by Caliper Academy, Chris Tamjidi, 
um, great guy who really has supported this work in the public sector um, and with their app. So they had a mindfulness app that they, they did the practice that supported the practice. Um, and oh, I used novel research methods. This is SenseMaker. Um, and it, through this, they collected narratives over the three month period, so almost like journaling. And they had to signify themselves what these narratives were. And I think the key takeaway, I mean, I could talk about this in itself, was that we expected on the, I'm going to put my glasses on, we expected on this that I've got here maintaining relationships at the top in this first um, triad, reason thinking and taking action at the bottom. And we were kind of expecting, I was expecting that they were going to say most of their work was about reason thinking or taking action, because that's what civil servants do. But actually, it's all about maintaining relationships. That is what their job is, and that's what they continuously said and what the data said. And, and then in interviews, I said to them, um, so it looks like actually your whole job is about maintaining relationships. And I, they said, yes. And I said, it, it is, now you say it. And I said, well, that's kind of facilitating people, isn't it? Embodied, extended minds, social. And they were going, yeah, well, it is, yeah. So what training do you get about cognition, perception, emotion? Because that's kind of what you're doing, isn't it? And they were like, none. None. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy, isn't it, when that's your job? So... I'm just going to give you a few quotes that came out of it that, that kind of really fits with that, with what I've just said, really. So the first one, so this is one of the senior directors um, in charge of the health service. So this is before the course. Before the course, I know I had a reputation as a fairly clear, straight-talking person who says it as it is, not in a demeaning sense, but with a clarity. In fact, I was described by a previous boss as their Rottweiler, which I think I wore as a mark of pride for quite a number of years. I was sent in to sort things out when they were not going particularly well. But I think what I realised was how frustrated I got when, despite the right answer being obvious and the next steps being obvious, people didn't, couldn't or wouldn't take them. And what I didn't have was a wide enough range of responses to cope with continuing difficulty. So I would find I would be repeating myself in subsequent meetings. I would say, well, you haven't done that, so try harder. It's not actually a very satisfying message to deliver. And I'm not sure it's a particularly helpful one to have. But that's what my team would have seen of me. It's fairly hard-edged, clear, demanding, not, I hope, unreasonably demanding approach, but that's what would I, I would have done. And he cared. He cared. It wasn't he didn't care. Since the course, I've been putting myself in the other person's shoes and trying to see the world through their eyes and understand why they find these things difficult and why they or their organisations find these things difficult, then trying to be much more empathetic rather than judgmental. I didn't mention empathy once to them. I, we, we talked about how minds work, about how bias works and perspective taking, really kind of understanding the other person's perspective. I actually find more about what's going on than you do in a more adversarial relationship, where people hide things or just share with you what they want you to see, not the bit they are worried you might have a go at them about. So we go on courses to how to have difficult conversations and you get a checklist, but that is not the same as having a culture in which difficult, um, clear conversations are expected and expected by the individual or the other half of that clear conversation. So I think we shy away from, making, uh, from it making the problems worse because you create a conversation where no one expects to have clear conversation. So the programme included dialogue and it included mindful dialogue together with bias, people looking at their bias as they had mindful dialogue. So they, and then they go out into the world and they would kind of practice then watching bias, using the capacity of mindfulness whilst in conversation. And strangely enough, it makes them compassionate when they actually hear, they actually realise what they've got to do. Someone's enabled them to kind of investigate that and they do something different. Um, so here's another one. So I think my normal approach is to, before the interaction, decide what I want the outcome to be. Uh, and then I'm going to channel everything towards that. And if I don't get that, then that will be a bad outcome or I will have to come back to it again or whatever. So I've changed my approach. I now start by asking the team what they think. Crazy. 
in a meeting yesterday, I listened to theirs views first and, surprisingly, decided that their approach was better than mine. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Um, so I didn't need to intervene. This saves energy for me and them because they don't have to push back against the position I reached, which is key, isn't it? If all your work is like this pushing to and fro, it makes you stressed. But if we actually create working relationships that are you know, positive, informed, engaged, then all's well. So I'll, I'll finish. I've got to cut just this. This one, maybe a couple more. Well, not a couple more, maybe one more. So this is a classic one. An email somebody sent to me. I really dislike this person. So really understanding that. And I know I dislike this person. I was about to reply with a really, really nasty email back. And I stopped myself and I reread the email. In fact, I reread it about two or three times and realized that I completely misread it. And I'd instinctively replied. If I distinctly instinctively replied, I would have caused myself and others no end of grief. That, that's me. This is really interesting how you found a, a strong felt sense stopped you seeing information. Yes, so I found particularly with this email, I was kind of in an agitated state because this person had sent me something and I was reading it so fast, I was looking for things to find fault with because we looked at confirmation bias, how that interacts with mood and therefore how this just is inevitable. And then they'd done the practice so they'd been able to see that themselves. Um, I wanted to find things wrong in it. And it was only in the second, third reading where I kind of brought my agitation levels down. So we've got that sense of regulation, but then um, I could actually read it properly. So that was a bit of an eye opener in terms of how we deceive ourselves. I'm thinking, how often have I done that? How often have I not read something and then drawn a conclusion that's completely wrong? And these small like micro interactions are what make up our policy making and what make up our political process. And so this uh, the person working on poverty said, I have a narrative that enables me to understand what's going on and not suppress my emotions, but notice them and decide whether I want to behave in line with them or choose some other form of behavior. I think I went with emotional suppression before, but it's about noticing and understanding what it is and deciding whether you want to go with it or do something different. I actually think this is all much more important in, than, than, than values. I think it's actually... In, in relation to some of my colleagues who I have a lot of respect for. But I actually think because we need to, you know, we all share, I did work on values before, we all share the same values. It's how those values then get kind of enacted, I think. We do need to connect with ourselves and what we care about, but then we need to be able to have difficult conversations and kind of work with how we're going to do that. Just, just quickly, despite the fact that I didn't really talk, it wasn't a classic mindfulness course, I wasn't talking about stress or about presence in the same way, it still actually did incredibly well on all the mindfulness scores because Caliper Academy um, did a before and after survey and relative to all their other courses which were a little bit more traditional um, in the way they work, um, this program actually did exceptionally well. So I'm going to finish now. Um, this is a... Um, Australian jewel beetle and uh, Australian jewel beetles this is a male Australian jewel beetle finish on a lighter but but poignant point um, the female is brown and bubbly and so um, the male is kind of designed because we're all just designed to see patterns to go for a brown and bubbly thing and the brown bubbly things across the Australian impact out back these days are beer bottles so unfortunately the Australian Jewel beetle is attempting to mate with, jewel, with um, beer bottles instead of the female. And I put this in because it just sums up that, the, um, that the, uh, we're not really designed to see reality. That's not actually what serves us in uh, evolutionary wise. Mostly what serves us is being able to see patterns. And that's what this program was about. Um, and that's what the work's about. And in a way, that's for me what ultimately Buddhism is about, you know, how do we see, how do we construct reality and how can we use that aspect to kind of really develop programs and ways of working uh, that will make the change that we want to see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rachel.
I think this might be more of a confused comment now rather than a question. Um, I'm thinking about the examples that you gave, you know, in, in the workplace. Um, before I ever heard of mindfulness, uh, teaching people how to have difficult conversations and introducing motivational interviewing and all that sort of thing, and good quality leadership and management training would have been designed around these principles. So part of my question is, is this just putting the mindfulness tag onto something that we've already got because we've mindfulness is the in vogue thing. So that's one sort of question in my mind. And then the other one is, um, we've talked about people in governance, we've talked about policy makers, we're talking about people in the workplace, we're talking about mindfulness for stress. Is, is it a different form of mindfulness depending on the context? Or I, I'd sort of come here with the sort of maybe naive understanding that mindfulness is something that we could easily explain. And I think the first presentation um, echoed my view of what I understood of mindfulness. But as the afternoon's gone on, I'm beginning to wonder if there are other strands to it that I haven't been aware of. So I suppose the nub of the question is, are we using the term mindfulness because it's the in thing to cover things that we've already had? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, both great. Well, actually, I, I kind of see them a bit together, really, in the sense that, yes, um, you know, a lot of this work in terms of listening, difficult conversations has gone on, possibly not always in the public sector, you know, little bits in the public sector. So my context sometimes, with all due respect, you know, they're different to other organisations. So there's a specific context there. But also my experience of the kind of work um, that you're discussing is it doesn't necessarily de include developing capacities in metacognition. So a first person inquiry, um, whenever into um, what's happening in my own mind as I'm having these difficult conversations, usually the work, so it, they, they actually work really well together, you know, actually exploring the felt sense, you know, there's, there's very, I haven't come across very much work that actually builds capacities for exploring the felt sense alongside those management type, listening type work that you've done. And then putting that in the context of bias, which um, has a, maybe a social context. And I, I completely agree with you. What, what we actually need are trainers who can um, work in a particular context, understand that context, understand the wide net of mindfulness, and then design something that's going to work in that context. So I think the whole thing is a lot more complicated than maybe some of my colleagues, if we really want to make change. Thank you very much for the um, excellent presentation. I just want to go back to one of the slides when you um, said there was a, a lack of consensus and certainty over many of the defi definitions of psychological uh, components and uh, cognitive components. Uh, mm. I, I'd like to add that the default mode network, DMN, which is the, the, the part of our brain that's active when we're not actually doing anything. Mm. There has been research over the last two or three years that's taken that thinking forward, both with traditional forms of meditation um, and with secular mindfulness. So I think that's, that's a field, and it's actually revealing some new things about meditation and mindfulness generally. But the, the idea that there are these areas which are which, and I'd agree completely, there's a lack of consensus over the definition of mindfulness. We don't have, we don't have measures for compassion within the cognitive community that everyone agrees with. It, it draws out the question, how can we then understand the effectiveness of meditation and mindfulness if we don't have the instruments to measure the effect of mindfulness? Yeah, and um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, <coughs> Exactly. Yes, how do we? I mean, that is the question, really, isn't it? And can we, I'd love personally, uh, you know, to have research, our research, bigger research centres, maybe with a wider kind of remit, more kind of, um, more of these areas. I don't see a lot of um, research that actually widens, widens it out um, a little bit in terms of, yeah, we've got this issue about the actual definitions and then about the scales and how does this all fit together and how can we take it out of the well-being like it's always in the well-being or the mental health kind of frame 
Um, so I just think it needs um, funding in different areas and in different ways to kind of look at look at this really. And then how do we train our mindfulness teachers as well, so that they actually can, can they actually be trained in in more of this and then be more kind of context, be able to deliver relative to a context. And then how can we design research that will actually then tell us something about that? And obviously, qual quant research and widen up more social sciences coming in, perhaps to actually um, look at different ways of getting data out of out of this whole system. Really yeah, yes, indeed. Well, I'm, I'm putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, having uh, had personal experience of quite a few meetings that looked like that nightmare that you described or put on the slide, what would be your idea of how those sorts of meetings in the public sector should be taking place, given that you're often talking about large numbers of people with very intense stakes in particular issues sitting in the room together vying for the control of a mic um yeah and really what i want to bring into the field is that the, those systems are based on a particular view of what the mind is you know that's based on a historical kind of view of rationality and hierarchy and that that's how we best come up with a decision um what i'd like to put in system is and, and kind of what we did with the senior civil service is like, well, if the mind, if it's more like this, and when I say mind, I mean extended social, I don't want to be too neurocentric here, um, is like this. Yeah, how do we design systems that are going to better facilitate that? And really the piece that we can bring in is helping people to understand that and then design systems that work better according to that. Because what, what's missing is that piece from my perspective that I could bring in is that they they're kind of not seeing their blind spot um, that that this isn't the best way to work with the mind and it's that, that's the bit that's the kind of the elephant in the room because we could start to look at people like Google or whatever that we you know we hear all you know they're, they're constantly working in more innovative creative ways there's lots of examples out there uh, of how that's done um, but the civil service needs to find their own way really um, and it's how we, what we can bring in, I think, as mindfulness trainers to help to facilitate that and not to just maintain it by just kind of dealing with the stress aspect. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Hilda and I come from Belgium and we work also in the public sector, mm -hmm. we three. And um, I want you to ask, um, to show the slide with the different um, issues that we have to, uh, that you should interrogate your directors. It's three slides ago, I think. Oh, wait. Yeah. Thank you. This one. No, no. This one. You want to yes, see this, this one? one? Thank you. Take the picture. <laughs> 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 Easy. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.